My name is Ingrid. You can find me on a lot of internet places talking about pretty weird, complex subjects like DNS and observability and security in really silly, fun ways. Uh, usually unicorns are involved, hence the unicorn reference. Um, but what I do as part of my job is being an engineer on the API team for Netlify. Um, I joined them at, in the beginning of January. If you're curious about it or you have thoughts or feelings about Netlify, I'd love to nerd out with you. Um, find me after uh, at the after party. Um, but it also means that as a confession to start with, I don't get to do as much JavaScript now. I'm more focused on, on the back end. But I really, 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 really love the web. And it's been one of the reasons why, uh, years, years, years ago, one of the reasons why I decided to be an engineer. So back in March, when I was trying to figure out what I should talk about at CDJSConf, I realized that this year actually marks 30 years um, since the first proposal for uh, the World Wide Web has been submitted. It was also a really awkward time when I realized that I'm now older than the World Wide Web. But um, we're going to steer way past that rabbit hole into more exciting things. Um, so I think it would be, I thought it would be a really fun thing to do a little bit of a retro of what happened in the last 30 years on the web and some exciting things that are uh, coming. A lot of people are talking about WebAssembly. There's a lot of buzz of WebAssembly. So let's try to figure out how we can integrate that and how that actually fits and how we ended up creating something um, like WebAssembly. So going back in time, we are now in 1990s, and we have the first web server ever and the first uh, browser that was up and running at um, CERN. And um, in 1991, uh, things rolled out quite quickly. Um, and the first WWW software and the great, 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 great grandfather of the browsers, uh, a line mode browser, was released along with a web server to be able to serve all that content and a library for developers. And I think this is a really interesting point, the fact that the first software uh, suite that shipped, shipped with developers in mind. Um, and it was catered to be distributable and for people to be able to contribute from the beginning. And people really loved it. So in 1994, which is just three years later, the web had almost 10,000 servers, 2,000 of which were commercial, um, and about 10 million users worldwide. So that was quite impressive. And a lot of people started really paying attention. It was this new way of communicating. Everyone was really excited. And with all that hype and with all that excitement, there's also been a lot of talks about the fact that the web needs to remain an open standard. And I think this is one of the most important points, uh, regardless of what you're trying to experiment or which browsers you use or which company you work for. The web has always started with the idea of being an open standard and be open to everyone, from developers to uh, normal people that are just looking to learn something or um, do, dif do different things with, with a browser. And in 1994, to be able to support that, um, the W3C, or the World Wide Web Consortium, I'm really bad with long names, um, has been founded to protect the interest and division um, for, for the web. And then we're in 1995, and this is where it gets interesting, and you might know why, because it's the reason why we're in this room. So the world in 1995 was very heavily Java, uh, dominated. And what's really interesting is that the JVM in the beginning started with the idea of um, creating um, for the web, creating rich internet application and applications. And it was actually seen as being a web technology. Fast forwarding to, well, now, uh, probably JavaScript is slowly dying as a, like a back-end server. Um, and it's mostly used on perhaps data pipelines. But it's quite interesting that it actually started with the web in mind and not at all for what we're using it today. So people started thinking about what they could do with this really powerful language and if perhaps there would be a way to put the JVM in a browser um, so that you can run what ended up being called Java applets um, embedded into your HTML page. So Netscape Navigator, which was the browser at the time, um, shipped a feature called the Netscape Plugin Application Programming Interface, or NPAPI, which took me a while to pronounce. I kept remembering it as NAPS or NAPI. I like NAPS. It's kind of fun. It's easier to remember, too. Um, and the whole idea was to allow 
um, the developers to create a set, to create plugins um, that can run uh, as uh, web that can run as web applications. And something else shipped in 1995 as part of Netscape 2.0, and that's a new language that was created in 10 days. I'll let you guess three times what that language was. The one we know and love, JavaScript. And JavaScript shipped in Netscape um, more like a toy, like a way of doing fun things and creating some perhaps user interaction, something to make the pages more engaging. But if you wanted to do like super serious, computation, logic, voodoo, magic things, you were supposed to use Java. And it was branded, rumor has it, that it was branded as JavaScript, even if it has nothing to do with the language, maybe like a syntax similarity, just as a marketing, uh, as a marketing tool. So with that, the web became, well, this. A lot of really weird things. Uh, people were doing a lot of um, hating on the Internet Explorer, and there were a lot of GIFs. This, these are all still live, by the way. There was a lot of cams. The one on the top is the San Francisco um, fog cam. I think this was from last night when I took a screenshot for the slide. I remember like back in the day, like I grew up in Romania, and my university had a cam, and I, you could go to like the university website, and you could like watch kids going, like students going to classes or not going to classes and going to somewhere else instead. Um, and I really love this uh, Space Jam thing because the company that I work for, Netlify, uh, we are somewhat known for coin coining the uh, term Jamstack. And we run a conference and we talk a lot about it. And Jamstack for us means JavaScript, um, API, and Markdown. Quite different from the Space Jam that it was in the 90s, in a way. Um, but it's really interesting to see like this circle of things that keep reoccurring. And we're going to see that a little bit throughout this talk. Internet Explorer is evil. I don't know about that. Um, so a lot more companies got excited. And then Adobe got excited, actually Macromedia got excited and created something called uh, now the legendary Adobe Flash, rest in peace. Um, but it really changed the way um, people were thinking about what can be on the web and it created a lot more animations and it created a lot more games, things that weren't necessarily very achievable or very clunky and like very, very hard to create in Java. You probably remember this. Do you? The eternal time killer called Farmville <laughs> back in the day when Facebook was more of a games platform. Anyway, a long time ago. So with all these exciting and like different types of content happening and everyone trying to figure out what the web should be like, a lot of the people, it attracted the attention of a lot of companies, more specifically Microsoft, that was thinking, hmm, maybe I should create a browser. Maybe I should be able to uh, cater for serving content out there. This looks like a fun thing to do. So the late 90s became pretty much a war between Netscape, which was the first browser, at the first modernish browser um, at the time, and Internet Explorer. Um, for more funding and more resources, Microsoft ended up um, ended up actually winning. But the, uh, what this time created was a lot of uh, inconsistencies on the web where developers would um, specify like this will only run on Netscape or this will only run on Internet Explorer. And it's quite interesting to see that this still happens today. We use an app called Coda for different like docs related things that will only run in Chrome. So we're, not, we're still not very far from that story. Um, but the early, early, early versions of the web, um, you'd have to cater, you'd have to uh, develop with the browser in mind quite a bit. And people weren't quite sure what's going to happen. There was a lot of hype. It wasn't necessarily making money. They weren't quite sure what to do with it. There was a lot of time and a lot of resources and a lot of engineering. So 2001 and 2002, um, something called the uh, dot-com uh, bubble, uh, burst. So a lot of the companies that were created back in the 90s, like Pets.com or uh, Boom.com or something like that, um, ended up not being able to be profitable anymore, not being able to um, to run anymore. And they died. They went away. Um, so people started thinking, oh shit, actually, maybe this is not that stable anymore and I need more users to be able to make sure that I'm not going to die as well. How do I get more users? Well, one of the reasons why it was so hard to get more users is because you couldn't 
just build a website and make it available everywhere because every browser was doing whatever the hell they wanted at the time. So there was more and more of a push for web standards. Web standards to support my app being able to run on any platform without me worrying too much about it so that I can make money and get more users, more users, more money, yay. So the web uh, grew quite a bit. Um, JavaScript grew quite a bit as a result of that. Um, and the fact that the standards, the uh, uh, consortium pushed more and more for the standards created the stability um, across the web. Until 2008, when um, people started thinking, OK, uh, JavaScript, we should really, now it's gaining a lot of adoption, we should really, really make this more performant. So browsers started thinking about a way of doing just-in-time compilation on the browser with the idea of speeding up the performance of, of the JavaScript. And 2008 is actually known as the performance war, uh, where the browsers were competing into which one has the better compiler and can compile JavaScript faster. And with all that surge in performance for JavaScript, there was also an increase, well, the <laughs> web frameworks also, as we know them today, where specifically Angular started um, gaining adoption, st st being, was released and gained adoption in, in 2010. But not everything was peace and quiet and um, peaceful times and peaceful standards with happy users. Because there were still a lot of the plugins from the late, late days, now late 10 years later, days of the internet, and more specifically, Flash. Flash had a lot of security vulnerabilities, and people put up with it for a very, very long time because Farmville is cute and it's very addictive. And it's nice to not do work and play Farmville. So people ignored it until this flashback Trojan um, happened. And it, um, I, I read some statistics on it. I think it af uh, affected about 600,000 computers over like a matter of hours. Please correct me if those stats are wrong. Um, but it was really crazy. And it really attracted the attention that, hey, maybe plugins are something that you shouldn't be running. A lot of people were campaigning for plugins to die. And in 2014, HTML5 was shipped, which allowed people to finally not come up with excuses about why they should install Flash or why they should install Java in the browser. Um, and the focus has shifted to client-side computation with JavaScript. And the web became the adult that we know today. A lot of apps, a lot of uh, cool tech companies doing cool things, uh, tech things on, on the web, Google, Amazon, Facebook, etc., etc. And this is pretty much where we are right now as well. In 2017, people haven't quite forgotten the idea of running other languages on the web, though. And the reason for that is that JavaScript is awesome, and it's amazing, and you can do a lot of things in it. You can do cool animations, and it's great. But it's not particularly, there's a certain type of problems that it's not particularly performant at solving. For example, video is one of them. We're going to go into that for a second. So people started thinking, hey, there's a lot of languages out there, like C++, like Rust, that would be significantly faster for this particular type of problem, um, image rendering, video rendering. How do we find a way to run them on the web? So oop, whoops, I don't know what I've done. Haha. <laughs> okay, we're back. So a really easy way to describe WebAssembly is exactly that, a way to run programming languages other than JavaScript on the web. Um, and if your answer is, wait, didn't we just talk about that like back in the day when we ran like Java and like what what is this? Why is this gonna work now? And the reason why everyone is excited, one of the reasons why everyone is really excited about WebAssembly is the fact that it's really built with security in mind. So WebAssembly code is going to run on a sandbox environment in the browser, which limits its ability to have, say, access to your file system, which happened before, to uh, be able to corrupt the memory of the browser, which happened before. Um, so it's going to run in a very, um, in, in a very isolated and, and secure way, and it's built with preventing users, uh, protecting users from, say, plugin exploits, um, and um, protecting developers from, uh, say. C++ is notorious for uh, having to deal with memory quite a lot. So it's really aimed to provide um, a safe way for developers to, to, build co to build on the web. And its goal is exactly that, 
complica uh, more complicated logic that is difficult to do in JavaScript, but also portability. And for the first time in, well, uh, almost 30 years at that point, all the major browsers agreed um, to make WebAssembly a standard from the beginning, and it is now supported by all the major browsers, which is quite a big win, because they could not agree on that before. It's, it's actually the first time. So there's different languages that are supported at the moment. Um, main ones are C++ and Rust. I'm not going to talk a lot about Rust, because things are more straightforward with Rust, and it's a new language, so there's a lot of new development happening in Rust for WebAssembly, but I want to talk a little bit about C++ because there's some, C++ is one of those things that, again, has been around forever, forever and ever. It's not dying, it's refusing. Um, so it'd be pretty interesting to see why people have thought that C++ would be a good idea to compile to WebAssembly. So the way I learn new things and the way I try to wrap my brain around WebAssembly because it's quite a complicated, convoluted, you could read for a long time um, about it, is to try and build something. And I like the idea of, hey, just take some C++ code and run it. What could happen? Let's see. So I found this um, OpenGL, um, uh, I guess, C++, uh, really simple C++ uh, file that would build. You don't have to really worry about the code. It's open source. Um, and people are better at graphics than I could ever be on graphics. I hated it from the first time I saw it. It's fine. Um, that uh, when we run it, it will uh, paint, draw a rainbow for us. So if we try to run this locally, just build it on C++ and see what happens, um, it would look something like this. You would need a compiler, in this case, the CLang. I'm building this on a, Mac, uh, on, on a MacBook. Um, so this is why it, it, it will be different. Uh, the binary that is created will be targeted for that platform. So it will be different for every platform. But on Mac OS, um, we want to specify how, uh, like the compiler that we want to use to be able to compile and build this. The framework, which in this case is OpenGL with GLUT. Um, the fact that we don't really care about deprecations. Again, <laughs> OpenGL has been around forever. I think it's a 20-something year old library. Um, and I want to run my file. Uh, the last line is rainbow, uh, rainbow.c, which is the, uh, the open source rainbow generated. And then I want to create an executable called rainbow. And then I just want to run that as you would run, say, a bash script. And when you do, this lovely window pops up. And it's a rainbow. How cute. Yay. So how do we get something like that on the web? Well, um, this is where mscripten comes to play. So mscripten is kind of like an SDK. It's a set of tools that would allow you to take C++ code and compile it to either um, asm.js or wasm. Or simply put, it will create some JavaScript glue code that sits on top of the binary code that we just executed, or sits on top sits on top of WebAssembly, which is what we want to try now. So to be able to do that, we'd have to run something like this. Uh, EMCC, which is the compiler for mscripten. Um, O3, because we want the compiler to optimize aggressively. And then we have this minus s legacy GL emulation flag. And what this is, is it will, sorry, it will actually include all the OpenGL dependencies that mscripten has done a really, really good job actually porting so that we can use them without having to worry about where they exist, which is really cool, actually. We want to say that the target is WASM. And actually, you don't have to specify that anymore. It um, It's the default target, which I think is really cool. And then I want to have an output called rainbow HTML. And uh, the file that I'm trying to compile is rainbow.c. So what this will do um, is that it will uh, create a WASM module. We're going to go in more details into that in a second. Um, and somehow make it all work so that when I open this rainbow HTML, HTML file, I should see the rainbow. And indeed, we do. Yay. That's pretty cool, right? So if you don't create the HTML yourself, mscripton will generate one for you, which is the thing that we're looking at now. And whatever you output to the console, uh, you can literally use a print F or C out. It will be displayed um, on, on this page. Awesome. So OK, C++ is kind of weird. I personally am not a C++ developer. Why would I go through all of this just to get something C++ on the web? And the answer for that is that 
again, for certain types of computations, WebAssembly is built to be fast. I won't go too much into details of why it's fast, um, but I think it's really important to get the data whenever someone says, but WebAssembly is faster, and like the skeptical in me is always going to go, but why? So Lynn Clark actually did a really, really good job to write a series of blog posts that I highly highly suggest you read if you want to learn more about WebAssembly. She's done a better job explaining this than I could. Um, so really, really good reading material. But just as a TLDR, um, WebAssembly is more compact than JavaScript, even when compressed. Um, and decoding WASM is, on average, way faster than parsing JavaScript. And also, it's closer to the machine code. And you don't have to worry about garbage collection, because the memory is handled at the low level in, in the C++ code. So that's a TLDR of what makes it faster. But read the blog post. It's really good. So cool. That's a rainbow. It's kind of cute. Can I actually build something useful? So let's try and build something that you might actually be able to use somewhere. So I was trying to think there's a lot of demos on WebAssembly. There's a lot of cool things. There's a lot of um, image manipulations. There's a lot of conversions. Um, and I really like this. I like the fact that and something that's not natively amazing on the web is converting from one format to the other. And I really love that. And I personally really love fonts. I love typography. I'm a typography nerd. I love it. And I also really, really, really love SVGs, like a lot. I think they're awesome. And sometimes I would look at a really pretty font that's built by someone that obviously is more artistic than me. And I'm like, oh, I'd really love it if I could just take one symbol from that font and I can use it on my web page. But I don't specifically want to have to load the entire font or worry about it or like download it or whatever. So I was um, thinking that something that we could try together is um, converting a font to an SVG using C++, because that's kind of cool and a little crazy. So because I don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel, and I think this is a good point of why you might want to even look at C++ and compiling it to WASM, there's a lot of resources out there. The community is absolutely huge, and C++ has a vast adoption. So someone actually thought about converting fonts to SVGs before um, using C++ on top of a library called FreeType. That's a 23-year-old library that runs on most of the browsers and most of your uh, computers uh, to render fonts. And they've created this header file, really, um, that allows you to work with that library because it's massive in a more organized, st structured way, which makes it really easy for me to write something like this that includes, so the font to SVG HPP is actually from uh, the open source uh, GitHub repo. And it gives me access to this font to SVG glyph that will essentially um, take the letter that I want to, take the letter or the symbol that I want to convert and output the GIF the GIF. So let's go through um, the code a um, real quick. So the first two lines are more um, C++ um, magic to be able to do different things like um, print, uh, print things or open things, um, etc. Um, and the SVG function itself is pretty simple. Um, you have a font. It has to be, this library at the moment only supports true type fonts. And then um, it needs the ASCII code or the Unicode, Unicode code of whatever um, symbol you want to convert. In this case, 38 is the ASCII code for ampersand. So we're going to convert an ampersand using a, a TTF um, font. So we give those um, arguments to uh, the method that we just um, imported from uh, the GitHub repo. We create a string, and then we just want to um, um, run, uh, sorry, we just want to generate all the different parts of the SVG and save those in a string variable and return it. Because C++ is, you have to manage the memory. Um, you have to manage the memory yourself. We also want to free that memory when it's no longer used, which is why we have a gfree there. Um, and Something that C++ is really good at, but WebAssembly and JavaScript more specifically, is the communication between them um, is not particularly good at. It's just like passing a string all the way up the wire. So you do have to do a little bit of transformations to be able to get that string converted to a character array that then you can pass all the way up to JavaScript. And this is what this is trying to solve. I won't go into it. 
a lot because it's kind of like out of the scope. Um, but it's just something put together so that we can uh, return the string as it is to, um, to WebAssembly. So let's try to run this. It's very simple to uh, the way we ran it earlier. So emcc03, because we want to optimize, we want to use free type. So free type, um, again, is um, the free type C, li C library that mscripton have actually ported so that you don't have to worry about where those files are. You can just include it. It will just be included automatically if you reference it. If you don't, obviously, this will fail, and we will all be very sad. And then you have to tell um, you have to tell EMCC how do you want to export your runtime methods. So from the code, like going back from the code, uh, you will notice that my SVG uh, method doesn't have it's missing this um, mscript and keep alive um, that is on top of the uh, get get a message uh, method. And the reason for that is that mscript will ignore everything that you don't tell it. Uh, you don't specifically tell it to keep. Um, to make part of the WebAssembly module. Um, and there's two ways to export the runtime methods. One is uh, CW, uh, C CRAP, which is the one that we're using, which means export the entire function as it is, because I want to reuse it in my um, uh, HTML, in HTML slash JavaScript, or just uh, return the value, which is CCall. And then Remember that this is going to run in the browser. This is where it gets interesting. So it doesn't have access to your file system. It doesn't really know. Again, this is super dummy. It like runs locally at the moment. It doesn't have a notion of where that font might be. So they've created a really, really, really smart way of doing this by being able to specify which files you actually want to embed. If you want, say, a favicon from local, or in this case, a font, you can specify that with embedded file, and it will be automatically included in WebAssembly, which I think is pretty cool. Um, the last two lines are obviously the output. So I want to output this in an SVG HTML. And then uh, the file that uh, where all my methods um, exist, which is SVG C++. C++. So if we run this and we keep our fingers crossed, we should see uh, three new files being generated. One is a WASM module that if you open is just a bunch of gibberish, um, very similar to when you open a binary file, for example. The other one is a .js file which is the JavaScript glue code that mscripton has generated to be able to, for you to be able to work with the WebAssembly module. And the third one is the svg.html, which when you open it will look very similar to the previous one, that black box, and then mscripton at the top. So we don't quite want that. Um, so we're going to write our own HTML file. Now, I'm not really the world's greatest designer, obviously. So this is very simple, very hacky, just to see if we can get something together. So what we want to do first is uh, load our, our um, WebAssembly module. So we want to do that um, every time the runtime is um, initialized. And we want to create an API to be able to access the methods that we've exported from C++ to then use in, um, on, on our web app. So in this case, my method is SVG. It takes two parameters. Um, sorry, my, my um, local method is going to be called SVG. And the WebAssembly method that we've exported is get a message. And it takes an argument, a string. Uh, sorry, it returns a string and takes no arguments. Um, so once we have uh, once we have that set up and our module is loaded, we can do something with the, um, the the SVG string. In this case, what I chose to do is display the SVG as it is, and then display the SVG code right after that. And it looks something like this. I, I'm nervous about live demos, so this is kind of like a GIF of what it looks like. Again, it's a, it's amazing design. You have to admit. So the, um, the SVG is right at the top, which is the ampersand, as we expected. And then it just prints the entire SVG code um, that you can like copy and embed in, um, in, in your app. Um, and you don't. You can use this with any, almost any uh, true type um, font. So, for example, I love graffiti. I love urban art, um, and I thought it would be fun. I found this font. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm gonna abstain. Uh, but it prints all the characters look like graffiti, which I thought it was really cool. So, just by changing the embedded file um, to um, FFFT, 
TUSG, that TTF, we can actually uh, generate a completely new SVG that you can go and use in your app, um, which I thought I think is actually pretty cool for people like me that cannot draw but really want to. So. I kind of got excited once um, I went through that and I was like, let's compile everything to WebAssembly. This is awesome. This was easy. How about video? Video is something that is somewhat hard or complicated or weird to do in JavaScript. That would be a huge win, right? So again, there's this another really old library that is still the standard today. It's 18 year old, years old, actually. I'm obsessed with library age, um, called FFmpeg. And I was like, sure, I'll just compile FFmpeg using mscripten. It will be amazing. I'll just like do a demo of a video. It'll be super cool. Actually, turns out that as awesome as C++ is, it comes with a dozen plus plus build system tools, which means every C++ project has a way of compiling. And those ways don't really talk to each other. They don't really like each other. They hate each other. They're not best friends. Um, and FFmpeg was actually built to compile with something called GCC, which is a completely different compiler than EMCC. And obviously, don't, those two don't like each other. And it took. When I tried, I tried it for three days, and then I eventually went, I have other things to do, and I'm going to park it for a little bit. But it's it's a non-trivial problem to solve to be able to get this working. And this is something that, honestly, I've watched a lot of WebAssembly talks before today. No one really, like everyone makes it look like, yay, this is so easy. But turns out, there's like if you want to bring like really, really old, huge libraries, you might run into some problems. They're really fun to debug, but they're, it's not all like smooth sailing. And there's this really great talk about, I don't want to butcher her name, uh, Megan Slater, about lessons in WebAssembly and FFmpeg. And her team did this as part of an assignment, a commercial assignment for a client, where they actually managed to compile a part of the FFmpeg to WebAssembly. She doesn't really mention how that happened in the talk. And I would really, 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 really love to know how that uh, how they actually made that work, and it would be such a great documentation to, to have. Because it's not an easy problem to solve, and if we don't try to solve it together, we run into the problem where the web is not an open standard anymore, and WebAssembly doesn't really go where the web goes anymore because it becomes proprietary to whoever figured it out first. And that's not fair. It's very nice to contribute back to the web. And the Mscripten project is doing a really, really good job to do, uh, for that. If you're curious, there's a bunch of demos um, of libraries that have been ported, um, some of them to WebAssembly. Some of them don't compile yet to WebAssembly, but they do to SMJS. So you can go check it out. This was me this morning playing Quake. I'm obviously amazing. Um, great at jumping, but this is just in my Firefox. Like This is amazing. I haven't played this in, in a really, really long time. I was a kid the last time I played this. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's also other really, really useful um, libraries for education. For example, uh, this is the Bullet Physics Engine uh, from C++ that runs, um, that has been compiled to WebAssembly and runs, which is pretty amazing. We can build a lot of like really educational tools for this, using this. And going back to this idea that the web is supposed to be for everyone. WebAssembly is supposed to be for everyone. And um, I love if we could borrow a little bit of that 90s philosophy, where it was a little bit like the Wild West, but at the same time, people were really excited. And they were throwing a lot of things at the web and seeing what stuck. And where it really sucked was security. But now it doesn't have to anymore, because WebAssembly was built with that idea in mind. So it makes it very, very easy to be weird and experiment and build a lot of creative, weird things. So let's be weird is what I'm going to leave you with on this Friday. And thank you very much. <laughs>